I previously worked on a project called Transit uh, Sarah London Water, where uh, they wanted to find out what are the uh, traffic bottlenecks for agriculture transport. So they uh, have modeled um, pretty much the entire Australian um, highways, um, local roads, forests, things like that, to figure out where the traffic volumes on a annual and then down to the seasonal um, aggregates. So then you can then draw down by industry, um, by different kinds of filters. It could be like if you're interested in dairy or if you're in, in, interested in where the silos are for grains and storage. And then the team is able to kind of give you different scenarios and figure out uh, if you're a road authority people and you wanted to upgrade or maintain or build a road, how would that change the throughput uh, for a particular traffic? And you know that impacts the local business and so on. So um, I've done a couple of projects like this where um, I jump in about halfway to the uh, near end of the project where they've gone and done the modeling and they wanted to have some way of conveying that information and the data uh, to the stakeholders. So prior to this, they've had a bunch of manual reporting that they were doing ArcGIS, and they would create, you know, like re reports and PDF forms. And each time they send it out, it's going to be a manual, one to two weeks turnaround, and the PDFs will be upwards of 300 pages, and it's a bit silly. So um, part of my job really is to kind of looking at what are the different in interactions and platforms I can build, given data, uh, and then we kind of try to empower the people so they can. Uh, look at the information that they're interested in without being bombarded with all the things, while, of course, at the same time supplying the, the models and the calculations and the suggestions that will be recommended forward uh, to the stakeholders. So this talk is really about kind of my uh, process, but really it's also about uh, what I call the principles of data visualization. So uh, this talk will be kind of conveyed through five different sections. So I'm going to first uh, introduce the motivation why uh, we do the way that we do for data visualization. And then after that, I'll start to kind of drill into what I call the elements of data visualization. Uh, there are basic components that you compose to create a visualization, essentially. And then uh, in the middle, I'll talk about a little bit, touch on cognitive science in which um, we need to kind of understand how people understand. So it's kind of like a meta speaking, so to speak. Um, Everyone looks at pictures and uh, interprets them differently, and they have their own uh, sort of like autopilot versus critical analysis modes and things like that. And uh, we need to cater for different kinds of thinking so that when we present it, it won't be misleading. Uh, I will touch a little bit on accessibility of data visualization as well. Uh, this is not a typical accessibility that you may be thinking about if you're an engineer, where we look at you know screen readers and so on. But it's really about how do you provide a broad access of data visualization so that uh, people who want to, to uh, reproduce your research or wanted to get into your data visualization or wanted to find out more about it, um, they won't be blocked because of a lack of information or access. And finally, I will touch on um, a bit of my design process so you get a bit of insight about how um, I go from understanding a problem space to getting data to producing or at least the steps of producing initial prototypes and hopefully get to a bit of um, see how I kind of put things together as well. So that kind of wraps up the talk. And I'll wrap it up with a couple of um, insights at the end, of, I hope. So first of all, we'll jump into uh, motivation. Why do we do data visualization? Um, I want to open uh, this section with a book that was written by a guy whose name is Beveridge, and I think his name is very yummy. But he wrote uh, and adopted, in many ways, scientists are pioneers. He was talking about um, how scientists are exploring the edge of knowledge and he's trying to understand what are the things that hasn't been done before, but then they need to find a pathway to get to that answer. Now, while we're doing product solution development or even data visualization, we might not be creating new knowledge per se, but we are answering the question of how do we get someone to go from A to B? They need to have the understanding that uh, it's not just from what they already know, but also given the data and given the tool that they have. And that question, uh, oftentimes when you come into a project, hasn't been answered. So uh, really, it, it, it is about adopting the spirits um, of a scientist so that when you jump into a project, um, you're able to figure out what are the best ways to going forward without wasting too much time. Um, I look at data visualization um, in, I guess, a few ways. Uh, one of the things is about collecting data. So imagine we have the world of Earth or space universe as we know it. You know, we collect some data from the world, and um, that 
it's almost always, if not always, partial to the actual world that we have. It's never really the perfect capture of what is actually happening in the world. And so what we do is, you know, we might figure out ways to transform the data sets, we might figure out ways to understand what is inside, and we might even use visualized tools to figure out what we're looking at. And this is like a very high level, you know, there's probably more things that we do, but categories of um, the process that we go through to understand what exactly is the data that we have just collected and what can we learn uh, from it as well. And of course, when I say we, I mean the people in this room, I mean people at CSIRO, I mean people uh, who are the domain experts, uh, have the technical expertise or the knowledge uh, understanding to interpret this data. So it's also important to remember that that we is also a subset of everybody um, on the planet or might benefit from the data. So oftentimes that our uh, perspective is also not uh, holistic, just as data is not often capturing the perfect picture of the world. And um, there's many kind of people takes on what is really the purpose and of the data visualization. And they all kind of eventually draw down to the same thing. And I'm going to use my own terminology here, but you will find that uh, different people use different terms. So when I think of data visualization, I think that there's three primary purposes of why we do it. Um, one is we want to kind of attract attention, perhaps, or trying to make it aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing so that someone who uh, originally may not be interested in the, in the problem space um, might now be curious. Uh, we want to perhaps inform the viewer or the audience or the stakeholder what it is that the data has um, discovered or uncovered, and we give them the tools and knowledge so that they can make better de uh, decisions. And finally, there's also the kind of emotion uh, level to it in, in a sense that when you design, because it is visual, so everything is by foundation design, uh, a data visualization, what it is the message that you're trying to convey and does the visual imply anything or what are the implications that this data visualization someone can learn from it. So ideally, when you do data visualization, you want to be in between them, uh, per, per, preferably in the middle. Now, it doesn't mean that other kinds of work uh, don't necessarily fall into the middle, but I find this to be a useful model to think about it because when you think back in the 70s and the 60s, we have lots of things like scientific visualization, we have informatics, uh, sorry, uh, we have infographics, and we have different ways of depicting data, but it often kind of fall into one or two of the three, and sometimes not all three. Uh, in some cases, they do fall into the case of all three, but in the case of scientific visualization, perhaps, they tend to fall into the informal implied, and they kind of don't care as much if the chart looked any way presentable or not. Uh, and in some other cases for infographics, they can be very exaggerated, they can be very, um, you know, like extreme in terms of what they're trying to say, but they don't necessarily have the correct scales or tools to inform someone what it is the source of the data that they're talking about. So it kind of falls onto the attract and imply. And I try to keep in mind that these things need to be balanced. So um, it's not just about convincing someone, but it's also about make, make use of the data set that you have. Um, another thing I like to kind of think about all the time is the concept of uh, human in a loop. And this concept comes in various different forms uh, from uh, doing something and then immediately getting feedback from it so you learn from the things that you're doing, or uh, the fact that people, uh, there are people who collect data, do visualizing, do analysis, it's not just ma machines in the middle and nothing else anymore. And machines are you know, code written by people as well. So at some point of this process, whether that's the design, the beginning, or the beneficial out of uh, a machine or process, there's human somewhere in between there. And in terms of data visualization, I think um, it really provides you like a special understanding of what you're looking at because it is pictorial. And humans are oftentimes, I think um, someone, somewhere I read it, we use like 70% of our processing powers in the brain just on the visual stuff. And we often kind of use our eyes as the primary uh, sensory um, thing, I guess, in our body. So, you know, we can make use of the spatial understanding that's built into our human brain. And at the same time, when you have something that's interactive, um, it provides a logical understanding of, you know, when you did something, when you do something, uh, what comes after and what has changed because of your actions. And you kind of get a sense of, uh, get an intuition, perhaps, of what it is that the data is trying to tell you. So it is also pretty good to keep in mind that you can uh, add human in the loop in various ways. So um, to conclude this section, um, data visualization leverages our visual cognitive abilities, our ways 
our natural ways of understanding a picture to deliver a message. And I'm going to stress uh, this point throughout this talk. The point of a data visualization, it is to convey a message, a narrative that is built into the data. That is something that you have decided either unconsciously or consciously, and your design will imply that message. And hopefully you can design something that uh, will pique someone else's interest. Uh, so data visualization makes that seeable. Uh, it is really about trying to uh, present something that's not just numerical, logical, but also it is something pictorial that hopefully uh, will be memorable as well. Okay, so we're going to jump to the next section. This is going to be a good ride. I hope you enjoy it. So um, there's many things that you can consider what goes into a data visualization. I'm going to just go through the basics. So. Uh, I call the basis element as, you know, some element represents some information. So if you do this, uh, you will have, in fact, have done data visualization. You can say A is B, and then you put it in a picture form, that's job done, you can go home. Um, but really what's important here is that people often forget uh, not only just how simple it is to present something, um, it, it, it is quite an art to kind of, you know, make something interesting or make something that's understandable, and we'll start to unpack some of this. So coming from a more artistic, perhaps confusing sometimes side, this is a project uh, that was done by Giorgio Lupi and uh, Stephanie Fosevec, in which they send each other postcards once a week. Um, one of them will be based in London and the other one was based in New York, I think. And um, they will send each other postcards and but the beginning of the week, they will decide on a topic, uh, whatever data that they want to collect and visualize. So in this case, it looks like they wanted to visualize urban animals, the animals that they see in their street life. And um, this is uh, Georgie's take on um, you know, what it is she wanted to visualize. So perhaps the size of the triangle, it is relate relative to the size of the animal. Um, the color of the marker that's on the top left side of the triangle perhaps mimics the color of the fur of the animal. Um, if the animal is more furrier or less furrier, there will be more lines uh, or less lines on the bottom of the triangle and so on. And while this data visualization is not really useful in some way, but it's quite interesting to just kind of play around um, of different elements that's quite abstract. And you might recognize that some of this is just really uh, connecting what we often see as legends in a scientific visualization sense. So you might say that circle represents this, the radius of the circle represents this, these lines represent this. So by defining a legend in your data visualization, you have already defined the visual language uh, in which you're going to convey whatever data ideas that you're trying to convey. So uh, this is something that's kind of quite important to think about, but you can obviously pick any elements. Um, it is something that we do all the time. So that's really the basis elements. Then the next thing, you know, we have different things that's category, uh, that, that can be put in categories or have uh, some kind of natural sense of order. So, you know, a categorical would be like, this information is part of this particular visual graphics perhaps, and an ordinal thing will just be ordered by a different kind of feature. So uh, to take an example, this is a work done uh, in New York Times by uh, Josh Katz, Claire Ken Miller, and Kathleen Flynn. So they are um, the editors and graphics designers at the New York Times in which they looked at, I think, submissions uh, to the romance column at the New York Times. They looked at both submissions that were accepted and rejected. And they also decided that they wanted to find out um, what are the words that's used more by male authors and female authors. They recognized that authors do come in genders other than just the non-binary, but then they decided that th this is the data set that they're going to go with. Um, approaching the top, you have words that's used more in essays that are accepted and published in the New York Times. And uh, approaching the bottom, you have essays that's more likely to be, sorry, words that are more likely to be uh, rejected. It was never published, but they retain the manuscript. So they decided that in terms of category, they're going to use blue for male and pink for female. And the size <clears throat> of the circle is how certain they are for a word that has been um, collected in the data set because they do look into things like when a female author talk about mother, does, it, does she mean that the mother is in a different mother she's talking about or just mother in general or is it herself? So they do a bit of reading into the uh, essays to figure out what are the likelihood of those words actually used in the way that they're intended to in these novels or essays. Um, and you can see that the uh, direction of the bubble side, like on the top right, um, marriage appeared to be uh, more likely to be published by female authors and um, on the 
bottom left, I suppose, um, time will be a word that's more likely to not appear and not be accepted for whatever reason and used more likely by male authors. So this is like a really, um, you know, good example to see both categorical and ordinal attributes of a data visualization. And um, I do uh, recommend you later to check out the slides with the links as well. This thing is, is actually interactive, so it's pretty cool. The next thing um, that I often talk about in data visualization is what I call a visual metaphor. And what I mean by that is we're going to say, uh, instead of this is how I represent something, I'm going to say that uh, these data sets can look like this. And this is often quite abstract, but often can be also quite useful uh, depending on the project that you're going for. So for example, this is an artwork that was done by um, Dima Yarovinsky, I think that's how you say his name, uh, in which he just printed out the uh, terms and conditions of various popular social media uh, and applications. So you can see that when you print them out, it is uh, quite ridiculous. And on the right hand side, the most longest one um, is Instagram. And he decided that um, you know we often click through these things and it's really ridiculous to not even reading them. And so, well, this is how long they are if you actually try to read it. And he didn't really try to unpack any of the data sets. He simply visualized the length of the terms and conditions uh, and then just kind of showed it visually via the length of the fabric. So it is a very powerful way of trying to say, you know, this is how long these things are. It's kind of ridiculous when you print it out. Another example uh, was a work uh, done by Preto Cross and John um, Wheatley, I think that's how you say his name. They were commissioned by National Geographic, uh, the magazine, to visualize the uh, immigrants or immigration uh, in the US from about 1830 to 2015. And um, they went through the data sets from the US um, Bureau of, of Statistics, and they decided that they're going to show uh, the immigration like tree rings as if you can kind of see the age of a tree. So for each ring, it is uh, roughly about a decade. And uh, the different colors and directions in which the dots or the uh, dashes are coming out, are the different parts of the region that the uh, immigration are coming from. So on the top left, we have Oceania. On the bottom right, we have Africa and so on. So you can see um, the top, which is the kind of bluish color, that's Canada that there were perhaps two major waves of uh, Canadian immigration into the US between 1830 and 2015. And it is quite interesting. Uh, it, again, this is just like a visual metaphor to say that I want to represent something that may look like something else that will provoke a different kinds of thought. Uh, finally, there is uh, the most obvious way of data visualization, which is called direct rendering, in which you just say, well, I'm not going to try to abstract or decide a legend. I'm just going to show you a photograph. Like this is the uh, as detailed as we can capture it uh, in our daily lives. So um, a good example of this is um, a company in New Zealand called Mars Spine Imaging. They recently came out the world's first uh, 3D scanner that you can put your feet or hand or something like that into this MRI-like machine, it's not quite MRI, and the data set that has come out of it is already uh, in true color. So um, if you are familiar with MRIs and CT scans, you will know that they only know the density and perhaps the compositions of the elements or chemicals or whatever it is in the solids that you're scanning. So then they have to go through a segmentation process to figure out what are the compositions of this particular part of the object and then they can assign the color. Uh, in this case, they have kind of have done something, I'm not sure how to do it, I think it's a mix of infrared and x-ray and things like that, to just give you the color um, of the object, which is quite amazing. So this is like a good example of what is a direct rendering of data visualization. This data set you know, may have been post-processed a little bit, but there's no more uh, aggregation or abstraction beyond what it just captured. So to summarize uh, in terms of what elements, uh, trying to remember that we have data, which is the beginning. Uh, we want to reach an understanding or tell someone a message, which is the goal. We're trying to convey some kind of story that we have already learned through the data. And the journey of data visualization is often quite windy. It's uh, unknowns. You have to try different things. Some work, some don't. Some work's amazing. Some is just complete a waste of time. And that's OK. Because um, when it comes to data visualization, you are not only trying to juggle uh, what, it, what is it that you're learning from the data, but also trying to understand what other people understand and then trying to fill that gap. So uh, it's often a very trial and error process. And you have to kind of keep doing it. Right, so uh, on to the third section on cognition. Let's talk about how people understand things coming into classic psychology. 
So uh, a psychologist named Kurt Kafka, as well as maybe four or five other colleagues in Germany uh, back in the 1930s, uh, came up with this idea called the Gestalt Principle. And it just means that um, people are really good at looking for things that aren't there. But because of the way that the shapes present itself, we seem to see illusions of things and we're able to pick up something. And what uh, Kafka really stressed is that the whole, as in the picture together, is something else than the sum of its parts. So you might have heard of a saying that you know the sum is greater than its parts. This is completely different. The sum is something that's other than the sum of its parts. So what that means is that uh, if you put a picture, the whole picture together, say if you look at A, uh, you might see a triangle in front of three black circles or spheres or something. But if you took any one of the way, um, and even if you just look at one of the Pac-Man shapes by itself, you wouldn't see the triangle. The triangle would, be, would, would not be there. So our brain is really good at filling the gaps of connecting invisible lines, uh, of joining perspectives, of understanding overlaps. So uh, it's kind of something that we can take advantage of, but at the same time, we need to be aware uh, how people might interpret p pictures differently or be misled. So a good example of this, uh, might take about three seconds to see, but once you look at it hard enough, you might see a Dalmatian, uh, perhaps sniffing or drinking something from the ground. And the funky thing is that once you see it, uh, you can't unsee it. And our brain is so good at picking up patterns. Um, it is quite amazing. Now, the gestalt principle does not tell us why our brain is so amazing at picking up patterns, but it does tell us that we are good at picking up patterns. So. Um, I guess the takeaway here is that, you know, keep in mind of what it is that you're presenting and cater to our, our visual cognitive strengths. And also be aware that when you put things together, it could be something completely different. So you have to look at things at various levels. Um, another part of the gestalt principle is the idea of a pregnancy. So uh, it came, came from the similar schools of psychology where they came up with like maybe 10 or 12 different laws of grouping of how things can be interpreted differently just because they're visually or spatially placed uh, together or separately. I'm just going to touch on three of those and you're welcome to, of course, uh, read about more. So one of them is similarity. Uh, when you color things with the similar color, uh, we, we will be really good at thinking that they're the same thing or they belong to the same group, even if they're scattered randomly in different places. Uh, the second thing is proximity. So when you put things together, they seem to form uh, an area. Or when you draw a circle you know, around something, they seem to form a group. So our brain is really good at figuring out what belongs to a group and what is not in that particular group, but in a different group. Lastly, there's the idea of closure. Uh, if you just draw lines uh, connecting things, our brain is really good at picking out, OK, so this is how you're supposed to organize this information. So uh, looking at the right-hand side, if imagine the concentric circles were there, it might just look like a bunch of random dots on blue. But now the circles are there. It might look like something, oh, by the way, you know, these might be planets, this might be something, but they all belong to, you know, on the same circles given different radius. So the idea of closure can be quite powerful if you can figure out um, what are the good ways of connecting things via lines or areas. So I always like to look at the New York Times because they have a, an amazing team doing uh, data journalism. So this was a uh, work that was done in 2012 in which they looked at the droughts uh, in the states between, I think, uh, late 1980s and 2012. So uh, they've kind of covered uh, or rather made use of really good process of the grouping principles. So for each section, you have a crop. It's pretty obvious. The top is corn, the bottom is soybeans. And they can scroll on to show you more as well if you went to the website. Um, on the bottom, you can see like some kind of line chart uh, or sorry, some kind of bar chart, but that each chart is uh, bucketed so that each year is its own group. And uh, on the right hand side, you have a map of the droughts in which the yellow is less severe and the red is more severe for a drought during a particular year of your selection. And the uh, black dots are the density maps uh, for the particular crop that's being planted in the States. And so each dot will be at roughly 10,000 acres. Um, and they tell you about, you know, how is it that the crop is doing every year, you can also run and play with it, and uh, what are the differences between that year and a particular index year. And they show you the price per bundle or per pound, depending on the type of crop as well. And it is quite well logically uh, presented. So they're able to kind of categorically look at what is the data set that they want to present, 
and then put them in a way that can be absorbed without overloading because you know they have so much data in this one block. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the idea of how people represent and how good are we at approximating the particular visual elements. So the work um, kind of started in the 70s, but the major work that was broke through uh, was by William uh, Cleveland and Robert McGill in 1985 on the left-hand side, in which they uh, recruited participants in their university and say, given these you know, very standard charts, can you tell me what uh, a particular you know, line might represent? So you might re remember that uh, in bar charts, for example, you might see it. Um, we often don't see numbers on the bar charts, so you kind of have to draw an invisible line from the end of the bar chart to the scale or to the axis and say, okay, this is probably roughly 7.5 or something like that. So that's what they wanted to test. They wanted to find out how good are we at approximating a visual elements. And they came up with um, what's in the middle now, um, the rank from top to bottom. So the top is the, the best. So people have the least number of errors that they can approximate a quantitative value given a visual element. So if you have something that's um, about a position on a common scale and or identical but like non-aligned scales, we're really good at looking at those. Compared to things like angles or slopes or areas or volumes is pr pretty bad. Um, we're super bad at judging the subtle differences between colors. So naturally that's kind of ranked last. And this is important to keep in mind because you often see data visualizations that uh, we'll have a weird starting point or we have all these kind of funky angles or worse they try to assume that people interpret areas the same way as they interpret radius and you know that has a drastic difference of how you uh, represent data in a way that's one-to-one -one or whatever it is that you wanted to say. So this study has been uh, pretty big it's been replicated many times and one of the things that that has been replicated was by uh, Jeffrey here and Michael Bostock in 2010 in which they looked at compound charts as well. So if they do stack charts side by side, they can look at various tree maps perhaps. And then they brought in pie charts, they brought in uh, all kinds of things. And they kind of got to the very similar conclusion. So uh, you know, when you have something that's just one dimension, share a common scale, people are pretty good at estimating the value of this uh, chart compared to things that you know has to do with radius or pies or circle packed algorithms and tree maps we're suddenly not as good at estimating the absolute quantitative value that the chart is trying to, to uh, say. So this is something that's really good to keep in mind. The other thing is that um, when we present a normal chart, uh, keep in mind what is the focus that you're trying to tell. So if you compare to the left-hand side, we have a group of bar charts, and they could be maybe quarter earnings um, over some kind of period. On the right hand side, it's beginning uh, to be more simplified all the way down to just the differences um, of the bar charts. So in this case, if your presentation is trying to uh, convey the difference between C and D across perhaps four different time spans, then it might do the picture uh, more, more favor and for everyone's comprehension to just show the differences. Uh, but at the same time, if you want to focus on something else, there is uh, definitely value to go back to the bar chart as well. Uh, but Think about what is the message that you're trying to say, and you, you don't need to overload people's um, or trying to say that, oh, they might see it, they might not. Just just say it, put it in the picture. A good example of this is in IBM Design, and they published a whole guide on uh, data visualization, so that's also linked in the slides as well. I really recommend it to have a go. Um, but they looked at the difference between absolute scales and relative scales, and both are valid. There's really no you know right or wrong in terms of how you want to present this data. But in this case, you have product A, which is the uh, teal bluish line, and product B, which is the red line. They might have you know, got some revenue in two different years, and they have different, uh, I guess, unit of performance. You might say that product B is doing better in terms of absolute revenue in the last uh, two years, but product A naturally had a larger turnaround compared to the previous year in terms of percentages. So if you want to show the revenue, you know, use the left-hand one. If you want to show the growth, show the right-hand side. And you have to make a conscious decision of what it is that you're trying to show and just kind of short circuit everyone's uh, thinking abilities and go to the picture so that the picture is telling the exact message that, that, that you're, you're trying to say. So <clears throat> to conclude this section, data visualization is about making data meaningful. It is really about uh, understanding what it is the message and the conclusion or even uh, the implications that you have come up with 
put into the picture so that when people see it, they understand what it is that they're looking at. And remember that different techniques and technologies are just tools to aid comprehension. They are not the, the end, uh, they are just means to the end. Um, so it is really about how can someone else who's never seen the data or who's never even heard of stuff come to your visualization or your tool or, or your charts and beginning to understand what it is that they're looking at without having to kind of scratch their heads too much. And so in a way that you are already summarizing something for them, but it is important that you empower them as well so that they understand what it is that they're looking at. Okay, so uh, I have this thing where when I do um, an hour long talk, I tend to do an intermission and then take a break. So if you haven't seen Hannah Gatsby's uh, Nanette, please go see it. It is on Netflix. If you don't have Netflix, go find a friend who has Netflix and have a watch. It is only one hour long and it is absolutely amazing. I recommend everyone to see it if you haven't seen it yet. It's uh, called The Net uh, by Hannah Gatsby. Was there any other questions? All right, I'm going to keep going forward then. Accessibility. Um, so I often see people producing data visualizations without making it broadly accessible. And what I mean by this uh, is best uh, presented by showing you what is a good example, what is, in my opinion, a good example of a data visualization. So uh, Max Rosa, who is a professor, I think, uh, in the state somewhere, uh, started this project maybe five, six years back called Our World in Data. And his goal was to show how much progress the world has made, not just in the last five years or 10 years, but as far back as he can find. So he published all kinds of things taken from the United Nations, the various government reported data sets. And the one that I'm going to show you is the life expectancy for different countries. So uh, the four different parts that I find are crucial in a data visualization, obviously, is the visualization itself. But then there's also annotations. Annotations might be highlights of a particular important region that your visualization is trying to say and you're trying to draw attention to. It might also be tables of raw data so that someone can look at a data set and compare that to the visualization and understand what it is that they're looking for. Um, he also publishes the data sources that uh, he put out. So how he collected the data, where they come from, uh, if he had modified them, uh, reason for modifying them, uh, even sometimes source code as well as other for the reading is all there. And finally, what's really good is that he, published this, he publishes the data set in a machine accessible format. So uh, oftentimes you see government websites, and government websites are the worst, in which you say, oh, I want to find out about this thing, and you go, oh, yeah, data is right here. You click on it, and it's like a 200-page PDF. And you're like, oh, well, I'm not going to type this out. So like, honestly, if you're going to put up data visualization and you want to make sure that that research or that study is reproducible, um, Max Rosa does a good job. Everything that he puts online is in maybe CSV, is in some Excel sheets, table. It's there. You don't have to like manually recreate it. So um, that's super important. So uh, I call this the complete data vi visualization because if you just take one of them out of it, suddenly it's less accessible. If you take two out of it, then it's kind of common what you see every day. Uh, if you take three out of it and you just leave visualization, well, it's going to be really confusing and no one really knows what you're talking about. So uh, this is the chart that he has on the website for our world in data in which I'm showing the life expectancy or the average life expectancy from 1770 to 2015. And uh, on the website, you, you can actually choose various regions and countries specifically and plot them as well. But in this case, I've just shown the general uh, regions of the world. And he annotates his charts. So in this case, he's told you that, you know, not only that's the data visualization, this is the exact data set that he's plotting. And sometimes you know, it's really difficult to figure out which dot and just about how much that is. So having this annotation makes it really easy to, di to digest and compare. Um, again, I mentioned before, he tells you you can download it and for every chart. So you can see that the data that I have uh, downloaded is in a CSV format, and it is quite easy to you know, parse. It's just three columns, and they have the different um, region, you know, the year, and the life expectancy. So like, super easy to follow. Uh, finally, he, you know, tells you how he collected the data set from where, uh, even papers that have uh, gone into this research, and also, you know, if there's further reading, he also points it to you as well. So I think um, 
we, we should all strive if, when we're doing data visualizations to um, have all these things together. If you're doing a report, if you're doing a website, if you're doing some kind of thing, make sure that your data visualization is not only presentable in the visual format, but it accompanies um, the data sets as, as well as how the study has gone ahead to produce this understanding. Um, because you're going to be able to convince people more broadly if you back up your, your research. So um, accessible data visualization to summarize, and, and I'm going to use uh, six points to emphasize it here. Uh, it focuses on the message. It has a story or a narrative that it's trying to say. Um, it abstracts data appropriately, so you don't want to overload someone with a massive data plot that's really difficult to understand. At the same time, you don't want to oversimplify, and sometimes it might mislead someone um, what it is that they're looking at. So you want to pick an appropriate level of, of abstraction. Uh, you want to deliver the content clearly, uh, visually, or write clearly, whatever it is. Make sure there's no mix-up, confusing language. Uh, you want to provide, like I say, many ways to entry. Uh, if you just have the visuals, it might not be enough. If you just have the table, well, that's even worse. So figure out uh, what it is that someone can go, on, go ahead and reproduce your work. So that goes into the data source. Um, it, there's too many times we see data visualizations or charts on the internet or the news, whatever. They don't tell you where the data source comes from. And that makes it really difficult to prove uh, or understand where they got the data from. So if you share just where they, you, you have the data, then someone can go and have a look and understand better. And it's not just about proving you right or wrong, but also they can have a, even a better insight because now they're looking at data themselves. Um, finally, it would be good to follow up with further resources so that if someone is really interested, they can look at a study or different people's work and so on. Um, another part of accessibility, I just want to quickly touch on the choice of visuals in particular when it comes to color. So you're probably all familiar with the Likert chart in which you put out a survey, you put in a statement, and you say, well, do you feel strongly agree to agree to neutral to strongly disagree about this statement, right? Um, and so the data set that comes out of that is not just a linear one to five, but in fact, there is a positive and a negative spectrum. So keep in mind the order of your data, uh, if it has a zero point, whether that's an absolute zero or a zero percent or a sentiment neutral, uh, pick visuals that will clearly show categories or directionalities of your data. Um, if you don't know what color to pick, this is a tool that has been around the internet for ages. It's called Color Brewer. And you can choose the number of um, data classes and how many segments you want and whether that they need to be colorblind safe or printer friendly or things like that. Um, they, you can also choose that things can be categorical. So in this case, they call it qualitative. They might be diverging or they might be sequential. Now, not all kinds of classes can be used this way because if you try to produce something that's sequential and colorblind friendly and you have, say, 14 classes, you will not find a color palette that will fit your, your uh, use case. So keep that in mind as well. And uh, I will touch on a little bit more at the end about how to solve this problem. So I gave this example at the Dev Talks, and I just want to kind of show this again that it was really nice for Dennis to point out there is this tool you can check for colorblind uh, safe, and you can just put, put, put in a picture, perhaps. So I was able to check my work and just kind of check that what would it look like if someone had a particular um, symptom in terms of what it can see or cannot see. So uh, this is a map of Mississippi River, and it was commissioned back in the mid 40s. And this is a really good e example to kind of overcome, I think, that color limitation of our understanding. So back in the day, they would have to draw all the maps by hand. Um, maybe there was a bit of a print involved, but there was definitely no uh, digital computers involved. So in this case, they've surveyed the geological formations to figure out where the Mississippi River might have been um, in different times. And each color might represent a decade or 10 years or 50 years, depending on how far down the scale you look. Now, uh, what's really interesting in this that uh, for each uh, point on a scale, so from 1 to, I think, 16, and then there's a couple other numbers and labels as well, um, they put that number directly into the colors. So you can see on the right-hand side, um, red is 18, and yellow is 16 if you look close enough. And um, there's you know blue that's 17, there's a striped blue that's 14 and 13 and 15. There's no confusion when you see a red. Is that is this a shade of red? Is that red enough? Is that the right scale? You know, they just put in that number so you know this region is that scale. There's no confusion here, even if you're colorblind. And also they, they used different patterns, so stripes, dots, to really uh, further differentiate 
the different uh, color choices that they have done here. And you know, it is totally valid to show uh, different levels of abstraction at different levels of viewing. So in this case, you can't really read a number from far away, but when you read closer, you can. So choosing an appropriate level of color down to details can also help uh, people understanding what it is the data that they're looking at as well. So that wraps up number four. And uh, the last part I'm going to talk about is a little bit on my design process. So uh, my favorite thing is pen and paper. I really, really like to work on, on understanding a domain after the, in the initial meeting. I will go and just uh, write down what it is the goal that I'm doing, what are the data sets that I can do, uh, what are the affordances and the things that the tool should have, as well as what it might look like. And I just kind of go through these you know, phases on and off. And the best thing about pen and paper is that if I didn't like one of my things, I can just scrape it, dump it to the bin, get a new paper out, try again. And paper is cheap, you know, like you can do it quite quickly. You don't need any kind of technical knowledge to do it. And you, you're, you're not going to be blocked by some kind of library or whatever. So it is a really good way to quickly iterate. And oftentimes this is the first draft that I will bring to my clients and say, well, you've given me this really well-defined problem. As far as I can see, this is what I think it might look like. Um, I don't do it all the time, but when I can, I, I try to do it because um, that is really the first stage of conversation to say that, like, you know, this is what I think it might look like. And besides just me talking about it, you, you can have a look. And then they're able to kind of get an idea of what it is that you want to do and then go back and forth with you to really narrow down the direction. Uh, the next thing then is I will just start prototyping in software. So in this case, this is a uh, project with, again, Lending Water to look at the adaptations of Albatross in Australia. I think it's primarily in Tasmania and New South Wales. Uh, so in this case, they wanted to model what are the population uh, rise and fall given kind of different strategies that the council might um, apply. And they have all these modeling that go in and out. So the, the, the council people can kind of select and figure out if they you know, deploy these strategies. This is what we think, at least um, from the first step um, of what where the population of albatross might go. Um, it's not absolute. There's definitely tons of uncertainty, but it is a start. So as time goes on, you might start to decide that I'm going to make it a, li a little bit more pleasing, add axes, add units, please add units on, on your axes, and also trying to provide um, you know, different ways that someone might be able to absorb the data. So in this case, I've linked the resources about what it is um, that we can do in terms of enabling the population of albatross to preserve its population count, if not going better. And also trying to say that it is actually not just the total of the population, but also the area below the line, which will show you the number of um, breeding pairs that you will gain over the years as well. Another project, um, before I go into another project actually, so this project eventually led to um, you know, a bunch of testing and then we realized that actually this is not what we want at all. We wanted to educate the council members what it is that they can do. So what we ended up doing actually is uh, I helped the learning world people to build a visual novel, which if you play video games, you might know about it. It is a game in which you have a conversation with an uh, environment, with, with a character, you pick things, and it's just a matter of point and click. And you click on an option, and then a new thing will appear to show you where the story has gone. So it is very much a choose your own adventure, but in the computer age. So in this case, we've taken the models uh, and the different scenarios that they've simulated, and we've built in a visual novel of, you know, someone can sit down, have a look at the current environment, they can make choices, and then the system will kind of run the simulation and figure out where things are going. So this ended up to be a lot more educational and uh, also that it was less uh, technical to develop because you can just you know, type the text, add a picture. It was pretty easy for them to kind of expand upon. That kind of became the final de delivery for this project. So it's not all about data visualization, but it is re really about understanding what it is that you're trying to solve. But uh, that happens too. Uh, so oftentimes I just want to draw an interface. I wanted to know that what are the different controls that I might have, uh, what it might look like on mobile perhaps, or the different stylistic choices. And some other times, if I don't know what I'm really presenting to because the um, brief is so vague or there's no similar work that's been done or the project is too early on to decide, then I go really broad to figure out, okay, so what it is that I have in terms of data sets, uh, what other works that have been done similar in this domain, what do they do about it? And what are the different visual ways I can use to start to explore and represent these data sets? So, um, you know, depending on the project, you might need to do a bit of research. You might need to collect a bunch of reference cards and mood boards 
and uh, different tools that you might uh, bring into your own work. So um, I want to talk about how I prepare data visualizations. And uh, before I do that, there is a point that I want to stress is that uh, data preparation is often underestimated in terms of efforts. So people might often think that, oh yeah, you're doing data visualization, you can do it in parallel with everything else that's happening. But really in reality, data visualization is grounded on the data itself. If you don't have the data or even the model, uh, it's very difficult to visualize something that isn't already concretely defined or measured. So you end up doing something that's quite vague and fluffy and um, it might not be accurate. So the design process is not only about the understanding of the data domain and you know exploring different ways to visualize it, but also trying to figure out how can we collect the data so that the data domain is more concrete and that our work is going to ground uh, on realistic data. So I often start to work from a CSV file or some kind of static file and I progress it to a live database. And the reason is because once you separate the, the data and the visualizations um, by themselves, then someone else can now add to the data set. They can now collect different things. And as long as the protocol is compatible, your visualization becomes a living tool for them to understand the data sets. So when it comes to developing a data visualization, um, here I've adopted six different points from a book called Design for Real Life. The original points were uh, developed for developing an arguments, but in this case, I've repurposed it for data visualization. So again, it is about the intent. What is the message of the work that you want others to accept or want others to know about? You want to present the data or the evidence that support what it is that you're saying. Uh, you want to bring in the context because you know everything has to be relevant to something. Uh, and also, what are the related works? And in terms of context, it's really about how you bring someone into this particular subject so that you can demonstrate uh, what it is that you're doing. So by the approach here, I mean like what are the visual metaphors, what are the visualizations that you're doing, how did you come up with this particular thing? And that's really important because if you don't show someone the process of how you get from A to B, they are going to be questioning what it is, how did you get to B? Uh, when you have done the study, you have to also propose your limitations. Not everything is going to be perfect. And so if your data set is only as good as the postcode, then you have to say, well, this, this visualization is only down to the postcode. I can't tell you beyond that. Definitely not down to the street level. So um, these limitations will be really useful when someone look at how you aggregated particular data sets or what it is and what it isn't that they can answer or find answers to. Uh, finally, you want to anticipate any questions that someone will ask. You might do this by following up the data visualization with further resources, uh, showing the data source, or you might even accompany that with a report or an article, or even a blog post, to say how you come up with this thing. And I think if you can keep all six of these points in mind, uh, you will develop a very concrete and solid data visualization. Uh, finally, another point on iterating on feedback. I think I've uh, kind of given this tip to most of you, but I just want to stress it again. I have this thing where I bring my work to different people each time I made some progress. So while we do things like with one person and then we go back to the client all the time, uh, we often forget that when they see it too often, they kind of get numb and they don't really know what it is, the tiny things that you have added now because you may have tweaked a little bit, you may have changed the data a little bit, but it's really difficult to give a high level um, broad feedback when all they're seeing is small changes. So then they have to resort to nitpicking. So nitpicking is only useful as a feedback when you are going to you know, publish or present the work and finalize at the end. Throughout the process, you, you really don't want nitpicking. You want to have a more directional, you want to have a high level feedback that will put you to the right direction. So uh, to solve this, I tend to just go to different colleagues, friends, people who know the data sets or people who's never seen it before and say, hey, what do you think of this? And they will give you a very honest, you know, sometimes brutal, but that's okay, feedback. But at least it's not going to be nitpicking and you have more perspective. Uh, you want to keep up the momentum as well. It's Sometimes we forget that we're kind of buried, have a tunnel vision on our computer, and we uh, probably don't present as often. But luckily in IA, we have a monthly uh, meetup and also, sorry, the monthly meeting and regular meetups. So I think that's not a problem here. But sometimes when you're working by yourself in isolation, uh, people probably don't see the progress and they don't really know what you're doing. So you want to keep the communication going. Uh, finally, you want to be uh, critical and be constructive, but also when you're getting feedback, uh, don't take it personally. It's just that someone's telling you something and it's not critiquing you, it's critiquing the work that you did. And that person probably wants to see you do better work, and so do you. So you want to kind of work together to say, 
you know what it is that I can improve on and when you want to defend or whatever you feel the need to defend uh, try to hold back and you can do that by iterating on your work and then show that you have taken that feedback and then put it into the work that you're going to do in the next iteration and that's going to be a better way to uh, defend your work because you have effectively made it more solid and more understandable so um, before I wrap up I want to kind of give some recommendations of books when it comes to you know more broadly in terms of data visualization. Um, if you're into what it is a, you know, what are the functions of data visualization or how can we make it really comprehensible, um, Alberto Caro wrote a really, really good book on information graphics and visualization. I recommend that. Uh, if, if you want to see more funky or kind of playful visualizations, uh, Giorgio Lupi and Stephanie's Pulsavec book, I really recommend it. Um, if you're going to uh, come after it as more of a university introductory textbook into data visualization, then uh, Andy Kirk's data visualization, as well as on the top right, Nathan Yao's Visualize This, are good books to start. Um, if you're looking for references, inspirations, just kind of different things to look at, Knowledge is Beautiful, as well as the other book, Information is Beautiful, by David McCartness, um, sorry, David McCandless, they uh, do a good job of kind of presenting different things, and every spread, every page, it, it's a different data visualization. So it's kind of a good way to kind of poke around and um, just get things in your mind. Uh, I mentioned a book, Design for Real Life, before. It is designed more in general, but I definitely re recommend it to have a good read. It's only about one hour. You can go through the whole book. Uh, Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics, um, while he's not talking about data visualization, he brings together the what is the story and the narrative elements that go into a comic. So how do you tell a story? And that is quite important when it comes to putting visualizations as well. Uh, finally, if you're interested in more historical work, um, Design for Information shows a lot of work from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century of the different work that's been done. And there's so many graphical, amazing things that's kind of lost in today's time. So you can go back and borrow those uh, knowledges as well. So I'm going to quickly wrap this up. Uh, programming is creative work. People often think that programming is logical, but really creativity is problem solving, and programming can be creative as well. And also being creative is a skill. Skills can be learned, improved, and practiced. So uh, being creative is not something that people just are born with. It is something you, you can try and educate yourself on. So in summarize, uh, the purpose of data visualization is to try to make it meaningful so someone can understand what it is that you just found and are trying to convey. Uh, Well-chosen elements will probably have better understanding. You know, you want to figure out what is the dimensionality, the categories uh, that represents your data the most intuitive way. Uh, consider how people read and understand a whole picture, perhaps, so you don't mislead people. You want to provide multiple pathways to access the data visualization. And finally, you want to expose yourself in different work and design theories and practice that and seek feedback. So uh, to wrap up, I want to quote that guy again, Beveridge, and he wrote this book called The Art of Scientific Investigation. In chapter 11, he says about a scientist, there is real gratification to be had from the pursuit of science for its ideals and can give purpose to life. And I think this is a really good mindset to kind of keep uh, in your mind. And when you go forward, you know, it is really about being curious. It is really about trying to convey something that you have evidence of.